Okay. The next complaint I have is this well, someone got the bright idea that fair value is a much better measure of net worth. Well, it looks good on paper, but can you actually apply it? Can you apply it and be independent? Now, now I'm going to split some hairs the other direction. And let's see how far we get on this. Now, fair value accounting is, is saying, let's say for whatever reason, that printer over there, which is going to go soon, <laughs> was a material asset. There are a lot of ways to measure the value of that printer there. It could be, but they're all, they're all subjective measures. And guess what happens when you have subjectivity? That's right. People are going to pick the one that's most advantageous to themselves. Will they? Yes. And so when the auditor comes around and realizes that the individual that valued that picked the most advantageous value for themselves, how could they not, how could, how at that point can they maintain their independence? If they happen to agree with the individual, with the choice the other person made for other factors unbeknownst to the original person that set the value for that item, and they come to their own conclusion in their own mind that the other individual is right, and they agree, they'll be independent in fact but not in appearance. What? Yes. On the other hand, even if someone is independent in fact and but not appearance, but they forgot about some esoteric factor that adjusts the value one way or the other, they've made a material then they're open to making a material mistake. A third individual might value it in some other way. Who has no stake in it whatsoever. Meanwhile, the first guy thinks he's manipulated the numbers and thinks the auditor has endorsed that. The auditor thinks he's independent, but he's not. I mean, but he's made a material misstatement, which is the wrong question. <laughs> Making a material misstatement is probably more important than being independent. Right? Because if you're not independent and that leads you to make a material misstatement, that's the name of the game not making material misstatements. Whether you're independent or not is a subset of lesser importance, although still important. And of course, the third individual who may will just say by magic he was actually correct would actually be independent. So how are CPAs going to go out and start making actuary decisions? We're not actuaries. Yet we expect our own clients to be just as um, uh, theoretically, but not in fact, the, the rulemaking body expects our own clients to be just as educated as we are, so we'll have our independence. It doesn't work. Okay, then today I was doing a... Um, a checklist, and we've, we've really gotten off. Uh, we've gone off the deep end when it comes to this, to these new accounting rules and convergence with um, international accounting standards. Well, over time, as you can imagine, over time, accounting rules, as accounting rules became more sophisticated to handle complicated situations, um, different rules evolved in the United States and, 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 and in Britain. The first core accounting principle is that debits equal credits. You know, probably accounting was first originally only measured on the cash basis, mostly. Uh, you knew how much cash you had, you knew what your expenses were, and that was it. And they hadn't come up with this concept of asset or liability. And what asset is, is a probable future economic benefit, and the liability is a probable future economic detriment. I'll owe something in the future, and asset is something I benefit from in the future. 
whether it's money coming into me in the future or actually the money to spend in the future. It's all the condition of what happens to me now measured against what will happen in the future. That's the way accounting was to start with and, and really should be. As time went on, people decided they were going to mess with this whole idea of reaching into the future and bringing it back into the present. So, um, and making estimates to go ahead and try to, to estimate. Let me give you an example. Um, not everything is consumed immediately when you buy it. So, for example, this staple was bought maybe, oh, 10 years ago, and it cost $50 when it was bought. But really, the cost for every year is probably about $5. So it costs $5 a year to use the stapler instead of $50 in that one year. And you can, and the argument is that uh, stating the financial statements to show staple cost at $5 for over a period of 10 years rather than $50 in one year is a better measurement of the cost of using that stapler. And in that sense, it's correct. Um, it's reasonable and it can be measured on an event that happened in the past, but only with an estimation of what will happen in the future. But solidly grounded on that event that took place in the past. Accounting has stepped completely out of that bubble with the idea of fair market accounting. And it is a, a big problem. And the reason why it's a big problem is it's asking us to compare unknowns. So, when, at such a point when accounting gets to where everything's going to be of a fair value, every asset you own has to be booked to what it's a fair value. Not everything's sold on the stock market, right? So if we're going to do the fair value accounting, say, of my desk or my computer, this computer was probably bought for around $900, say, about, oh, six months ago. But what would it, what would it sell <clears throat> on eBay for? Who knows? If you were to ask me to sell this on eBay, I would simply pick a price I thought was about right. Since I bought, paid 900 bucks for it, I would take into consideration the wear and tear that's been on it, um, the fact there may be newer computers that are out and other things like that. I might come up with a, say, well, 750 Maybe, right? Who knows? Right? Someone else might say 775. Okay. Now, when it comes to very, very large companies that have very large amounts of investments, um, and they're going to have, they might have thousands of shares of stocks of another company, or uh, in a situation where we don't know yet what the price is gonna, going to be. A company has uh, invested in some stock. Uh, oh, here's a good fictitious, fictitious example. Let's say uh, you're auditing a company a year prior to Red Hat going public about the value of that company and uh, the, the value of their investments. And you have to you have to uh, set their investments on their financial statements has to be set to fair value, right? But Red Hat has not gone public yet, but they're issuing, they're selling, they plan to sell their stock at $15 a share. And so what you do is you book, you put the value on their financial statements of $15 a share times the number of shares that your little company owns, you issue the audit. And then on the day, opening day of uh, issuing, uh, when Red Hat goes public, it's 150 bucks a share, not 15. Well, that was a material misstatement. You, you see, anytime you try to predict the future, you, you can, mistakes can happen. And I guarantee you that there's going to be some big mistake that's going to happen someplace with a big company out there somewhere, and the auditors are going to get blamed. But the, re the real thing is the accounting standard setters should get blamed. And it's, it's really a major... <sighs> setting things at fair value, you can see, is subjective just by the small examples that I have. There are some principles in finance that are supposed to be used, such as the stock price is supposed to be uh, the present value of future, future cash flows from dividends. But if that was correct, then Microsoft's current 
stock value would be zero. If that were the only factor. So there are other factors involved. And sometimes stock prices change and they have, there's really no reason for it at all whatsoever. So um, I think someday there's going to be a big problem with that. Meanwhile, when things like Enron happen, we get a lot more questions, or when the accounting standards boards try to come up with all these really fancy technical definitions, they can come up with something like a lion, which is half equity and half loan, um, you know, that, could, that kind of thing. When someone tries to be smart and tries to break the barrier between liabilities and net worth, um, things like Enron happen because people take advantage of those accounting principles. That's exactly what happened at Enron. And they called their liabilities, they, they said their liabilities were part of their net worth. And what ended up happening is, is that those liabilities were not part of their net worth and they went under and lost a lot of money. Well, suddenly after that, all of a sudden our checklists grow twice as long. And instead of having some basic questions to answer and our professional judgment to use to, to apply and to, um, you know, pretty much if anything major happens, list it there. Most people with common sense, when they do a set of financial statements, are going to know they're probably going to want to explain the accounting principles used, what the company does. Uh, things of that nature, but now we're getting down to little nitty-gritty, picky BS pieces of disclosure that really have nothing to do with the value or in value to the client, all because people are overthinking this whole thing and they're trying to one end is trying to massage numbers and people are trying to think they're getting all academic and more proper by coming up with this fair value, but I'll tell you, it's not going to be any better. The only way you could really measure something accurately is by at least having it within your own time frame of existence. I have no idea how much this cabinet right here is going to weigh when it, after it crumbles to dust, okay? But I do know how much it weighs right now. Um, accountants are not mind readers, we're not soothsayers, we're not predictors. And what fair market value accounting asks you to do is to be a soothsayer. To come up with a fair value of anything, you have to understand the basic um, uh, equation that's used in finance. It's called present value. And the basic accounting, uh, ba that basic principle is this. If I were to put a dollar into the bank and earn 10% interest, it would be worth a dollar ten next year. So a dollar ten next year is only worth a dollar today. Okay, that's an idea, a concept, a principle that has some academic background to it, but the problem is you don't know what the interest rate's going to be for this year, let alone next year. And so when you're coming up with a fair value of these stocks, especially if they don't have anything to do with being on the market, the company isn't public, has no sales yet, and you're expected to come up with the fair value for this thing, it's really, the answer is it's really undefined. But people are probably going to try to come up with a number and all these numbers are going to end up being wrong and where all these people here now are talking about how much more accurate fair value is going to be. It's not. If I was to use a fair value accounting for this printer here, maybe I just say it's worth zero, but is it really? No, I still have a, some kind of problem if you I can still print, it'll still work. It won't sell for much. I know that if uh, under regular accounting rules, it would probably be fully depreciated by now. Again, having no no worth, but you know, the materiality of that coming up with what it would sell, maybe fifty bucks if, if that is not really maybe the cost of the toter cartridge in there is <laughs> it's not really worth it. Um on other things that are very large that it's nebulous at best to try to value there's only it's like trying to say we can't get an accurate measure of the financial statements for a museum because we haven't uh, placed a price on all the priceless pieces of art in it 